welcome to The Poetry Show, and we are The Pod Poets, and we are here to discuss poetry. This is the podcast that aims to bring poems and poetic discussion to those who love poetry and those who really aren't all that sure about poetry, and we're just going to discuss a different theme each week and see if we can be the pod poets and take over your brain and teach you a new way to think about poetry. Occasionally, we might use a naughty word to discuss an edgy theme, so you have been warned. So... Let me see. In the past, we've done love, uh, we've done death, and I think today we're going to do childhood. Um, so that's the, that's the topic of today, I think. Anyway, so I'm going to go around the room, and we have four different poets here, and I am Rose, and we have... Alan. Yep, and we have... Lawrence. And we, where's Charlie? Where's Charlie? We're missing Charlie. What did you do with... Did you see Charlie? No. No? No. She's not... Is she... Hello? Okay. The, okay, we know that Charlie's not here today, actually... Charlie has not been feeling very well, and she's got a scratchy throat, and we decided sign language wouldn't work. So anyway, the theme is childhood, and Charlie's busy growing a baby, and so we know that Charlie will be sticking child and childhood into every topic she does between now and the end of time because she's going to have this child and probably see pictures but you know that doesn't work on it yet but you know we're going to have it we're going to have it all and childhood stories so charlie you are listening and um thank you for giving me permission to mock you because i'm, I'm going to do that and not only that uh be writing more poems about childhood and stuff so our topic today is childhood and um and so i think we've all been a child you know, unless we've blocked that out and we, we don't want to think about it anymore. Um, many of us have children or our friends have children or maybe you're a brother or a sister. And so you've had other children around you as you were growing up. And, and it's true. Mom loves them best. It's true. Anyway, so do you like kids or, or do you prefer OPs? which is what I call other people's, you know, it starts to make a smell or a noise and you hand it back and then you run away. So those are great. OPs are great. A lot of people I know are simply not having children. And I actually think it's a cool choice um, because sometimes there's too many people Wait about 70 years and we'll need more children. But, you know, so some people um, just don't want to have children and they get grief over it. In any case, so childhood is the is the topic today. Yeah. So we're going to talk about children. All right. Lawrence, do you do you like children? Do you want one? Do you what do you think about children? You? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think uh, I really want children. I won't. Nah. Wouldn't make a great father. I think I saw a video on YouTube where a child's toy went in the fire, and I laughed for about fifteen minutes. <laughs> How did it get in the fire? Did the father just chuck it in there after a while? Oh, it was like this flying fairy Tinkerbell thing <gasps> that just came up in the air and then went into straight into the flames. I've seen that one. I've seen that one, and it is hilarious. And, and how, you feel, yes. Our misery just made my day. Yeah, I know. So, yep. <laughs> She's all happy, and it goes in here, flutter, flutter, flutter into the... <laughs> so I'm not sure I should reproduce. <laughs> and it flares. It goes, mm -hmm. It's like a little bright part, yeah. All right, no, you're not sure about children. Alan, you have children, and what do you think about children in general? I'm pretty good, with really, because uh, I seem to be fairly laid back and so they just sort of come arrive get in my arms and fall asleep they're walking all over that's you, easy man. really you know yeah. you, they just come and sleep on me yeah <laughs> well um my daughter emily who's now uh, 25 which is shocking she's known you since she was 11 so you've been you, you you've got two sons of your own and you have like so you have two and a half kids in a way because em's known you for a really long time i guess i will start with a topic about emily and it's about when, well, when she was about four. And this is called Evolution. Towels strewn about the bathroom. Spoons and half-empty cups across the counter. Toothbrush on her nightstand. Finally, I don't have to oversee every detail of her life. With sad relief, I recognize my dawning obsolescence. I gather inside-out trousers and crumpled-up socks. Sometimes she dresses herself, too. And I remember the first time. I had sighed and bent to grab a pile of clothes from her bedroom play table quietly as she slept. And slowly I realized purple socks and a purple sweater, pink pants and tiny pink shirt. It was color matched, carefully selected coordinates all in a pile, ready for school in the morning. I could hardly wait. Sure enough, she comes into the kitchen, barely controlled glee. Will I notice? You dressed yourself, I observe. Yes, she allows grandly. And at first, the trousers were backwards, but I took them back off and turned them around. See? We stand, both silenced by pride at our accomplishments. 
So that was the first time she had totally picked out her own clothes and dressed herself. I think she was three and a half or four. And um, she, and then she dressed herself and she was like so, so proud about it. That was like totally cool. What is your earliest childhood memory, Alan? I think my earliest childhood memory was being in my cot mm. in a, um, actually we were in the middle of nowhere in the um, mm. Boland Forest. And I was able to shake my cot out of the bedroom, down the hallway, and out the front door. Um, that's about the first memory. So you, you you remember the bars of a cot. So your first memory is jail? Well, yes. And I had a window that would that would open as well that, that I seem to be quite keen on. A window in the cot? Yes. It, it, it acquired bars very shortly yeah. afterwards. The window. Okay. So you... you okay. That, where's, the, where's the forest of Boland? What is a Boland? It's in Lancashire. It's... Oh. Uh, Okay, see, I'm an American, and we have no sense of geography at all, so certainly not of other countries. So that's your earliest memory. Do you do you have a poem to go along with that, or not, maybe not that? Not directly, oh, no. All my, right. The, 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 I, I do actually have one, and I the trouble is I didn't bring it with me. It, it sort of came to me as we were discussing. This is, this is one of yeah. the problems of selecting poems beforehand, yeah. is that I have a very large book of them, and it's hard to remember all of them. Yeah, well... What do you have about childhood, yours or someone else's, or a son, or well, anything? What, what I've picked up here is actually a nonsense poem, um, mm. perhaps in the uh, Edward Lear type sense. Okay. But this was actually written uh, way back when when I was I'd been staying with a friend who had children, and uh, I stayed for a day or two, saving myself hotel bills uh, and things yes, but not really so i so dead. i wrote I, I wrote this as a sort of thank you poem okay let's hear it sam and ben and daniel too went to sleep in an open shoe and there to timbuktu afloat they sailed away in the sabbat boat mm. they saw great weed and the golden seed of an enormous bird in a poem absurd they sailed through storms of great bulbous corms and their hearts were calm with a smith-like balm and when they arrived at Timbuktu, they upped and sold the wooden shoe and bought a donkey with two humps who loved the boys like sugar lumps. They climbed a mountain to build a fountain that gave off the scent of a city gent. And then at Hedi Titicaca, they beheld the otter Taka, swimming in a sea of stories along with moral allegories. So by rushing whirlwind born, from their revered idol torn, with the shoe and donkey taken, they are in bed. It's time to waken. Mm. So you kind of wrote a poem that would that they could read to the boys. How old were they? Oh gosh, I don't know. The, the, the youngest one were, were fairly young at the time. Like what? Like five or two? You, or? You're, you're asking an old man to remember oh, a long way I back. Know. So, <laughs> they, but they were they were little tiny. They were, they, well, they, 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 I think the oldest one was about seven or eight or nine, something in that that age. They weren't that but, old. Do you like those kind of rhyming childhood poems, Lawrence? Oh, I used to be a big uh, Edward Lear fan. Oh, yeah. Um, must, yeah. Look, must look some up. Do you remember any of them? No. Okay. <laughs> I, I do remember something about a fish that had stilts to walk on the bottom of the sea. Is that Edward Lear? No, I'm oh, not I sure. Like we, we, we have the Pobble with no toes and the Owl and the Pussycat, which we should all know practically. Mm. At least mm. the first verse of. Yes. Well, yeah. And a, and a million, million limericks. Well, limericks would be an entire other show, wouldn't it? And then, um, <clears throat> anyway, all right. What do you have about childhood or comments about anything you've heard so far? Lawrence, because you've got to be both uh, Charlie and Lawrence. I was thinking, can you do an Irish accent? But um, Possibly, but I'm not going to. No, okay. Even though my name's O'Reilly. <sighs> so we just, okay. Charlie, you're listening and we're missing you. Childhood poems, Charlie, at some point. Okay, Lawrence, what do you have? So uh, this is a poem about uh, early memories, and it, um, it begins with a quote by Professor Richard mm. Dawkins, who I'd usually be agreeing with, but um, I found something a bit off on his, his comments about the limits of human memory here. I think he's doing it a, a disservice. So this is called The Cutting Room. We think back to our first memory, our first big adventure, and it's almost like there was a movie camera in our head, recording every detail. But that's not the way it is. That's an illusion. What we're remembering is a memory of a memory of a memory of perhaps the real thing. Sometimes I think I don't remember much. But then I consider how something as simple as a certain scent can circumvent my memory blocks. 
flicking through the copy of In Search of Lost Time, a relative gave me, taken back to 1995 by the smell on the pages. I think I'm an earlier childhood. I just see colours and sounds, flickers in my mum and dad's faces, point of view stock footage of me running around family occasions. Almost subliminal pictures of the kids I played with blend into a vibrant but indistinct mass like a finger painting. The more recent the memory, the sharper the clarity. The more recollections start connecting, becoming parts to a narrative. Far from comprehensive, more like flashes of memory, forming an audiovisual tapestry that's patchily edited from deleted scenes rescued from the cutting room. Mm. Images often as vivid as holograms, but equally untouchable. Because life's so inconstant, even our recollections change. Every time they replay like VHS degrades. I don't care if I can't replicate every special moment exactly. That's fine if I've got the essence saved. I love that. And you're right about the Dawson quote. Because I've heard that before, that we don't really have memories, and it's just something someone gave us. And I have memories that go back to when I was a year old and two years old. And I know those are real memories because I've asked about that. So, yeah, I agree. I mean, in context, his mm. uh, dismissing the existence of a soul, I think his argument is roughly that things ah. like memory gives us a false sense of, of continuity and really uh, every soul, cell in our body is, is constantly changing. But I just thought he was doing memory a bit of a disservice. If you think about how brilliant, mm. you know, your memories are, mm. the artistry of your, your mind putting together, you know, images of what you've done, where you've been. I'm not that bothered. It might get the color of a car wrong oh yeah something small like that but you're right about the smell too though i mean i i work with skeletons and i've looked at a skull and there's this thing called the ethmoid and it's right above your nose and it's what senses things uh, for smell and it goes right into your brain which is why so many times the smell of something will totally take you right back and drop you in the middle of wherever you smell that or have a strong memory for it i love that and um Pardon me, Lawrence, but that was that was almost a cheerful poem, or it was it was <laughs> it, it you know that was a positive poem. I liked it. Is are you is this is this a new Lawrence? Oh, I'm just not very well. I think. I think. Oh, thank God! You're, you're not going to turn like really happy on me. Mm. I don't want to. You know, you come in and start doing some you know rhymey thing. I'll just I don't know. I don't won't know what to do. You know, all happy. Don't ever become happy. Is that wrong to say? <laughs> well, your your poetry does sometimes go downhill if you're a bit too contented. I think you're right. Why do you think that is, though? I think if it's too, if it's going along too good, uh, there's more mileage in misery. Well, there's that. Yeah, you can talk about things. That's very alliterative. Right. Well, what what do you, what do you think about the memory thing, Alan? I mean, Richard Dawkins and all of that. I mean, I, I don't know. I I do think that we have memories that are real. You know, from. I mean, I know you said your first memory is is the crib and being in jail with a window, which is interesting. But you know, what do you think about about Lawrence's poem? You know, in particular, I I'm not sure that um, I'm very up with Richard Dawkins. Anyway, mm, uh, he, you know, he's, yeah. he is very everything that he comes up with. I've heard it's recycled from somebody else. And I'm 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 concerned that he is getting the credit for a lot of other people's thoughts and ideas. Ooh, that's Dim's fighting words. Right. Ah, well, I think um, I'm not altogether that sure about God and afterlife and all these other sort of things. But he's like a, a militant atheist. In fact, he's also he can be quite rude. I think and other people's beliefs. So yeah. So here he's just dismissing. Maybe the soul, but I think in general memories. Yeah, so I, I do think I do think that memories can carry on quite a while. Um, as a matter of fact, I have a poem. I was I was not sure I was going to get to it, but I think actually I will. Someone wanted to know if um, poets could write down their earliest memories. I think it's Carol Bromley, and she is um, she's awesome. She's a great poet, and she does a lot of um, of writing workshops and 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 writing prompts. And her writing prompt was an early memory and I and I came up with this one and it's called first memories with briefcase and I apparently uh, my mother and my father married when I was about two and a half which in, you know back in the early 1960s was a big deal that my mother had done all that on her own and but they'd known each other a long time clearly but so I met him when I was like two so first memories with briefcase and it's a prose poem so it's like a big wedge of words I'm very young Everyone else all knees, giants who loom in the distance, 
The floor is shiny and the space is wide and empty. A bag sits by, solid black. She'll trip over it, my dad promises. Rose can trip over something even if it's the only thing in the room. I am told I met him around age one and a half. Perhaps the novelty and my mother's fear have sealed this moment into me. In a few minutes, a giant dog will break the front window. My mother will scream and chase outside, me in her arms, me, and set me almost on a white table. But she misses in her terror. She runs to the big dog. I fall. Now I am two. I still fall at times within a dream. Next, the Florida sidewalk burns beneath my kinked legs, hot but wonderfully hot. Mary Rose, asks a neighbor, ain't that hot for you? And how can you sit like that? My legs are splayed to the side. It's M, I say, tracing my legs bent at the knees with the feet splayed to the sides. It's M, shaking the plastic colorful keys that I covet that belong to a much, uh, much younger neighbor. M for Mary Rose. So I have all these memories of being quite little and from Florida. And um, and I know I was about a one and a half when I met my dad. I remember meeting him, or I remember that briefcase thing. And when I was about two, a dog broke the front window. My mother ran. I remember the dog and the, the breaking of the glass and my mother going outside and setting me down next to a table. I remember the fall. I don't remember that, thank goodness. But um, I remember other things and like toys we left behind when we moved from Florida up north. So I think that memories do... Um, bits of them and then I've asked her about that did did a dog break the window why yes a dog did break the window and uh, did I did I like some toy keys from this kid yeah you really did you didn't want to give them back so these are memories that I actually did have and I've 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 tested them you know um but I'm with her so I, I don't know and like you said Alan your your earliest memories of the crib but what else do you have that's really strong I mean you grew up um well you grew up everywhere didn't you you kind of grew up yeah. traveling yeah, well, I mean, I think we're talking about early memories as before before the traveling. Mm. The proponents of uh, neurolinguistic programming in, suggest that the things we remember are usually tied to emotional highs. Okay. And, um, you know, that's why preachers create emotional highs during sermons, because they want to walk, you to walk away remembering something that they've said. And I, I think it's true. As I sit back, certainly over the, the very early childhood um, of that time, I remember things like um, being found in the river running in spate when I'm off with a little, the little three-year-old, four-year-old girl from next door. We were sitting there paddling in a river that was running in spate. What well, does spate we mean? Very, very fast. Ah. A lot of rain like it's been recently here. Okay. Um, other, other memories like the, uh, the Queen's coronation. Mm going to the house next door where they had one of those little televisions literally where the screen was sort of four inches by six mm. no like modern screens actually you know so small that you couldn't see anything in black and white and uh me- memories of those though oh yeah and being a herald at the fancy dress party that they ran for the coronation oh my so it was god 1953 so that's i must be been four mm. so it's it, it those are the and then obviously as i as i got older and began traveling, I do remember a lot of things, and there was because you know there's a lot of newness about traveling oh yeah um wow. and 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 it patterns itself you your thinking about other people and different people and different races becomes patterned in a very different way, and you become more tolerant when when you say memories are tied to high emotion though could would you, could it be a a bad emotion, a negative emotion, or is it always a positive emotion either emotion oh okay, so it could be either okay. So people are going to, people are going to forget bad things. I mean, remember bad things. Well, yeah. Do you think that we screen out bad things or we keep them? No, we keep them. Then I don't know. I I, I think there are the, the the psychology of this is very complex, particularly mm. when people start to wall off bad things into alternative personalities and that sort of thing, which is an, another issue. Do you have a child poem or a childhood poem? Um, about about travel? Do you have one? No. Not so much about travel. I've picked yeah. one here um, about being in India. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some references in this that perhaps need a, 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 a little bit of explanation. Cook and Kelvey in the first line, it's the name of the poem, was actually a, uh, a very, very fancy jewelers in Calcutta. And um, the little Mai, who is the dog that we had, a boxer, is named after a character in a Moomin cartoon that was um, brought, put out by the Times of India at the time. Moomin is amazingly still popular, especially in Oslo, um, in Norway, where you can still go and buy 
Moomin puppets in the shops. What what is Moomin? He's he basically is a very large um, hippopotamus. Ah, okay. And one of his little friends is called Little Mai. Did you grow up in India? Partly. 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 Okay. Um, from about nine till eleven, twelve. Although I was in, in England quite a lot during that time for school and so on. Okay, this is this is part of a group of a group of five poems. So this one is called India Three, Cook and Kelvy. Cook and Kelvy, seventeen jewels, read the front of my new watch with the expandable silver strap on my ninth birthday. Following haircut and scalp massage, toads and mosquitoes watch with me. The lightning sheets flay at nine o'clock. Contrast bright lit night against dim shadows of veranda. Watch the tropical still bubbles of nine swimming angels. Rumper wagging in lieu of tail, my little my lies unseen to watch my cake to steal unnoticed in the ninth of an eye. As evening closes down the sky, the choky tar stands to watch the black grounds for troubles through nine hours of night. Mm. I like that. I really like that. So that so you were nine and you got your watch. We're, we're, we're talking about my ninth birthday, basically. Yeah. I mean, on the veranda, we had a we had a a tank of angelfish, which are the angels. The chokidar is the guard mm-hmm. who always sits outside the front gate to keep bad people away. Mm-hmm. No, I like that. Oh. Okay, so you don't, you haven't traveled since you were eighteen, Lawrence, but you mm-hmm. have you have traveled. So what's the biggest trip you took and so if you were 18 the last one then you were younger and practically a child uh probably um ooh, well actually mm-hmm. funny enough one of my first memories is being on a plane and i was coming back from dubai which is where i lived for the first three years of my life ah wow so i've learned a new lawrence fact today dubai mm. wow it okay was very different back then but i have very limited memories i remember the plane journey i mm-hmm. remember going to a cupboard with uh, my childhood friend at the time and getting a toy car out mm-hmm. i remember um the desert which was um had lots of plants in it De- right i think it would rain every so often and then all this plant life would sprout out the sand that happens, I think. If, if something doesn't happen very often, when it does happen, it's a big event. Like in Norway, uh, you can actually see the flowers grow practically in the summer. This, a path will change from one day to the next. So you grew, you were born in Dubai? or No, I was born in Harlow, which mm. is less of an interesting fact. And uh, <laughs> yeah, moved there uh, straight afterwards. Right. But those early memories, I find they're slightly creepy early memories. It's almost like dreamlike. Mm-hmm. Like I almost don't trust that those things happen, but according to my parents, they did. See, yeah. So you've done the same thing I've done. You, you said, "Did I do this? Did I do that? Did I do that?" And 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 they were and they was they were real memory. I did not know you you grew up um, spending a lot of your early time in Dubai. Um, okay. Do you tend to uh, do you like heat? Do you like hot weather? I love hot weather. Yeah. Ah. I also uh, like curry very much. Yeah. And uh, ate much of it for the first few years of my life. Oh, yeah, but not too much, maybe. You still kind of like it. Oh, yeah, I love it. I was eating it in the womb, apparently. My <laughs> mum um, craved curry badly while, while she was pregnant with me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. Well, all right. Do you do you have another childhood poem of some sort? Mm, yep. Cool. Uh, this doesn't have a title, uh, so I'll just uh, get straight on with it. All right. Age four, I remember my granny Lumin giving a present to me. A toy dog called Paws, instantly special to me. Paws was just the right size to cuddle and cling to, drag around with me, have conversations and sing to. So I'd hold Paws when the lights went off for the night, after checking the cupboard for any monsters inside, which seemed a reasonable fear at the time. It didn't matter, I couldn't see any monsters, they were real in my mind. But I felt safe knowing my guard dog was next to me, my mother's lullaby still in my ears humming the melody. Age four and a half, mum went to London, I had to go with her. I hated busy places. She wondered how I'd cope with it. I insisted Paws get to come with me. My mum said no, but I might lose him, but gave him because he'd comfort me. So there we were, me and my mother at a station rushing. At such a pace I was afraid we were chasing something. Scared if I lessened my grip for a second, I'd be swept up in the crowds, lost in the city forever. Paws was in my bag. I left a hole so we could breathe. Guess we were running and it'd fallen through the gap. 
So glad that woman noticed it. Still shudder when I think of it, losing that object would have broken me. I still regret not telling her thanks for getting him back, the pain she prevented, she needs a medal for that. Hard to put what he meant to me in words, Pause was more than a friend to me, I loved that toy with such intensity it hurt. Didn't want to call him a toy, he was more than an animal. Who are you to say he didn't come to life when I turned my back on him? The world wasn't just reality. There was what I could see, then a layer underneath made up of my imaginings. My first imaginary friend, a cyborg piranha with rocket launchers for arms, alien battle armour. I didn't believe it was real so much as believe it was possible. Age four robot piranhas were conceivably logical. Me and my mates roamed the woods looking for hobbits and wizards with our imaginary friends back when God still existed. Before the paedophile hysteria, great fun, often totally unsupervised, we never got raped once. No violent video games when we were kids cause instead we put on hats, went outside and shot Indians dead. Often for poorly defined reasons, me and the neighbour's son, killing Native Americans before we understood the racism. Afternoons I built a base with him, out of cardboard bedsheets or whatever else the adults gave to us. Which was cool, except when his older brother played with us. I say played with us, he just sat there berating us, saying to us, I used to be like you. You just want to play. I'm actually building a base. You know, one of those kids that wants to be old from the get-go? Me. I never rage a date or the passage of time says so. Ooh. Oh, that's got stuff in it. That's got the toy that everyone, oh, I'm so glad. You know, my heart was in my, my mouth. And there was a hole in the bag and then the dog, I was like, oh no, you lost the dog, but you got the dog back. Yeah, I did. And uh, my mum was in such a rush, she didn't see the woman give it back to me. And I mm. must have been, yeah, about four, five years old. And I was a bit too young to know to say thank you. And I really regret that. Do you know what? You don't have to because um, four-year-olds can't play poker. You know, they are happy or they're sad. They wear their emotions on their face. And your little face must have just changed from thundercloud to joy. And that lady saw that. So she knew. She absolutely knew. She, she handed you back the dog and he went, you know, and you just, I, the sun came out, you know. So I'm, I'm positive she knew that instantly because a kid is an open book, I think. They can be. Um, so, yeah. And the other thing I liked was the, was the playing and and, um, and the kid who's old from the beginning and does not want to play. But the other ones that do. That was nice. I really... Uh, oh, Lawrence. What? That, that's another um, positive poem. Yes, I know. Oh, I my must, God. I must sharpen up. Oh, my goodness. That is really different. That's good. I like it. I li- Did you have a favorite toy, Alan? Do you remember that? No, actually. The, oh, my God. No. No? I, uh, nah. I think my favorite toy didn't occur till quite late on when I managed to buy for thruppence a Dandare and Digby um, lead figures from the uh, headmaster's confiscation box. Uh, what? You could buy someone else's <laughs> toy? You could you could walk in with money and say I'll have that dream and and that memory. You could. I, I think it was more complicated than that because <laughs> I, I nobody seemed to be there saying I want this. So it may have been there for quite while, some while. Okay. Well, what is Digby and Danby? What what did you say? Dan Dare and Digby. Okay. This this is English. American alert. <laughs> We're going to do a podcast on Americans and we can mock them and I'm allowed to because I am one. So it's Digby and. Danber? Dander. Okay. Oh, you ha- you have to get it right. <laughs> no. The, 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 it was there were characters in the Eagle comic way back in the ah. beginning of time. Okay. I'm not sure I had childhood toys either. I I had I had little ones when I was very small, and then I don't remember that many of them. I had books. I started to read early, but yeah, that's cool. That's cool. I like that. I like that. So, do you know this Digby and Danber, Lawrence? <laughs> Dan Dare. Oh, God. Okay, yeah, so I never, he does. I'm aware of it. I'm aware of the, the, the reference. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, good. Well, um, we've covered childhood memories and childhood toys and other things. I'm thinking, do we have any other childish things we can discuss right now? Anything? Any, any last childish moments? And that includes being childish, I think. If anyone wants to just have a little strop right about now, that's okay. Well, I think we all do childish things even till our advanced age oh god i hope so because i think the second you stop doing childish things you're you're done um you know i i think i'm always going to be the child in the room with them when i'm with some of my friends i think they are sophisticated enough to meet the queen and i'm the one who's going to trip over the carpet and say a bad word in front of the queen and then call her something wrong like i don't know something ma'am you know something something awful well, we, we never stop playing, really, do do we? No. I mean, that's kind of what we're doing 
you know, right now with words rather than, you know, Lego bricks or whatever. But well, that's s- true. Same principle. Yeah, no, we do. We And, ah, you know, you're right. And then we go to open mics and then we're always in front of the audience and we're, we're, we're trying out different things. And I'm an archaeologist and so I dig holes, you know. So, yeah. So I think I think that's probably why we're okay with not losing our childhood because we, we haven't. We haven't. Alan, you're waving a bit of paper and looking at me hopefully. I'm not waving a bit of paper. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm holding. I, I think that... Um, yeah. I'm, I'm torn between one of two poems, one about my own two sons, and then the other one is a back to a childhood, a childhood memory, this time in Iraq. I think, I think I'll read that one. Oh, yeah, actually, yeah, I like no. Iraq. Okay, so the yes. first one was India and Iraq. Now we're in and Iraq. And we've got Dubai. Dang, I'm from Florida. Did I say I'm from Florida? You're from, you came to England when you I were know, a child. but I've never been to Dubai. <laughs> I've never been to Iraq. I've never been to Iran. I've never been anywhere Middle uh, Easty. Again, the, the, this is a series of poems set in set in Iraq, and they're they're all childhood memories. But this is the only one which is a memory of me, as opposed to a memory of other people. Oh, I like that. The, okay, uh, so in, it's in the group. Go. His name was Tosca. This two-tone brown, ironic gel- gelding, proudly seating a six-year-old boy, taught on the bare back of indolent, obdurate donkeys, picking a never-repeated path amongst fat-tailed sheep and assertive, ragged goats. School to ringside rigour, this misplaced beast responsive to gentle touch and delicate heel, trotted and cantered with unerring precision and snorting pride, that the donkey boy now knew what a real horse could do. Mm. So it was a donkey? No, it was a horse. It was a horse. Why there was a prize-winning horse in the middle of the mountains in Iraq. I have absolutely no idea. It, it, it belonged to a guy called George, who mm-hmm. was from Le, Le, from Laban. And um, normally I went out with the, with the herds, with the, with the local tribesmen, and you just sit on the back of a donkey and sort of meander over the hills following the sheep. But uh, then George started to teach me to ride on his horse, Tosca. And, uh, and he had a paddock. But I have absolutely no Remem- understanding of why he had it, what it was doing there. It just was there. It was the horse that thought it was a donkey. We had um, camels in Dubai. Yeah. They d- used to roam free and they'd uh, come in the garden and start eating all mum's plants, which I used to find hilarious, apparently. But well, her okay. not so much, you'd have to chase them off. Well, the thing is was with camels, what what people who've never been to the Mideast here is that they're actually nasty and they spit? Or mm. were they, are they, are they, are they, they kind they, of They friendly? do spit, I think, but I, I don't have any clear memories of the camels. I'm just told that I used to like them. Okay, so you don't have anything like they were really kind of nice or nothing? I just remember them eating the plants, that's about it. Well, that'd be and getting good. in the way when people are trying to drive around. Oh, like wallabies down in, in, um, in Australia? Just, Probably, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, get the camel out of the road. Okay. All right. Well, um, you know what? This has been really good. I've been enjoying talking about childhood memories. And I'm glad, Alan, actually, that you read that one about Iraq. Because um, it's. It, I think we've been... I think as it is, we've been looking at things in, in a large way about, about childhood about childhood memory, which is really good. I think I'm going to read one more about Emily. And it is about memory, actually. Because when you think about... When you think about life, you don't remember all of it. You remember little minutes, like you remember the minute of the camel and the minute of the of the of the bars on your little cage, Alan, and in a minute of this and a minute of that. So it's about minutes, and it's called Emily because I really stretched on the title here. Um, anyway, Emily, childhood is the best part of life. When we are older, we look back and have blazing portraits of a scene here, a moment there, powerful images from our first years. But what do these memories add up to? 10, 11 minutes, the best part of life, and all we take from it, is 10 minutes. I watch Emily when we are playing or laying quietly next to each other and sometimes wonder if this is one of those minutes she will remember. You know what? I'm not sure I would now say that childhood is the best part of life, but it certainly, when I was writing this, I thought it so. We've been The Poetry Show, and we are The Pod Poets. You can tweet to us on Twitter at at Podcast Poets. You can find us online at poetry.show, and you can email us at podcast at podpoets.com. Find us on iTunes and, and give us those reviews and ratings. This has been The Poetry Show, produced by Sophie Hardbattle and edited by Adam Talietti as a production of Eden Agency.